Welcome to this webinar on migration from reusable plastic containers. We will be discussing a recent study that was published earlier this year by scientists at the University of Copenhagen and Dr. Selina Tisla, who's one of the authors of the study, will be speaking about this work on behalf of all co-authors. So welcome, Selina. It's a pleasure to have you here with us today. I'm also very happy um, that my colleague, Dr. Birgit Goike from the Food Packaging Forum is with us today. Uh, Birgit will share some data from our very recently published database on migrating and extractable food contact chemicals um, that we call the FCC MIGAX. Um, and Birgit pulled together data from FCC MIGAX to show you today about migration uh, from reusable food content materials. So welcome also to you, Birgit. Um, before we get um, to both studies, uh, I would like to give you some brief housekeeping rules. So um, the Food Packaging Forum shares knowledge and encounters, uh, encourages critical thinking. Um, we work at the Science Policy Interface and this webinar is intended to provide high quality scientific background information that will support policymakers and influencers alike uh, in their missions to better protect public health from harmful chemical exposures. And at the same time, we also like to support implementing the goals of the Circular Economy Action Plan. So we at Food Packaging Forum are very much interested in having a critical and factual debate about the science and the pertinent knowledge gaps pertaining to chemicals and food contact materials. We believe that only together with all stakeholders, we can achieve good responses to the big challenges that our society is currently facing. So we are strong uh, defenders of openness, honesty, and civil discourse. So in this spirit, um, I wanna let you know that we are recording this webinar today, and we also will uh, record uh, the discussion and we publish the webinars, the talks, and the discussion afterwards on our website. Um, we kindly ask you to please uh, rename yourselves in Zoom using the convention, your first name and then your last name or surname. And if you like, you can also include um, the name of your organization. And yeah, I wanna thank you for that. If you need any help with doing that, then just let us know, please. Please also mute yourselves uh, during the um, talks and unless you're speaking um, and also keep your camera off. Uh, after both presentations today, we will have time for discussion. And um, if you want to ask a question or have a comment, then please raise your hand in the Zoom function or you can also type your questions into the chat and we'll try and get to as many questions from as many different participants as possible. Um, so um, I'll then, you know, ask you to unmute yourself and turn on your camera to ask your question. Good. So here is today's agenda. Um, Dr. Selina Tisla is joining us from Denmark. She is currently still a postdoc in the Environmental Analytical Chemistry Group uh, at the University of Copenhagen. But congratulations to this, you, Selina. Uh, you will start a new position as assistant professor after the summer, also at Copenhagen University. So congratulations for that and best Thank of you. success. Uh, Selina's background is in environmental science and she specialized on analytical chemistry. And her research focuses on uh, chemical analysis in water, including non-targeted screening of compounds of emerging concern and identification of the transformation products in the aquatic environment. And with that, Selina, over to you now. Welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the nice introduction and the possibility to share our research here. I think it's a great opportunity in this frame. Um, I will just share my screen. And so, am I still sharing? No, I can't no. see it yet. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Trying again. Now something's happening. Good. Perfect. Okay. Super. So the title of my 
presentation is the migration of compounds from reusable plastic bottles into drinking water. To the background, uh, yeah, reusable plastic sport bottles are widespread used in different sports like handball, football, gym, um, but also especially in biking. But so far, these plastic bottles are only analyzed for well-known contaminants. Like, for example, there's a lot of advertisement that many bottles are bisphenol A-free. Um, yeah, but we started the study because Jan Christensen, the head of our group and part of the study, is also in his spare time a football coach. And his kids in his team were already complaining about the smell of the bottles. And we were thinking about what else can leach out of these bottles. So we were investigating a specific kind of reusable bottles. That's the bottles you commonly get in the sport shops to buy. And there are also the bottles what the whole football club here in Denmark was getting from the Danish Football Society as a present. So we had different bottles to investigate. And yeah, it was a little bit um, more time to figure out where this bottle comes from. But then I found um, some, yeah, some references to it that these are the biodegradable polyethylene bottles and the producers are saying that they are 100% recycled after use. And they say this is achieved by adding a bio batch to the material without saying what is in the bio batch. And that has no effect on the use of the bottle until it is in the landfill fill, or it's accidentally left behind during a ride through the forest. So yeah, it seems these bottles should not leach anything during use, but if it is just fall out of your bag and in the environment, it should be degraded. Um, and we were investigating if this is really the case that nothing is leaching out during the use. Our experimental setup was that we bought some new bottles. Yeah, yeah, here shown with this green star. And we always had glass bottles as reference material to compare it with something. Then we put the bottles into the dishwasher, the new bottles, but then we were also using some used bottles from the football club, which were used for one or two years, only filled always with drinking water before. And we're looking what is leaching out of these bottles after the dishwasher. And then we were thinking, how could a very, um, yeah, a consumer, which cares a lot about, wash their bottles even after the dishwasher to make sure they are clean. So we cleaned them with uh, room temperature, tap water, just um, five minutes per bottle, really shaking, always with water, putting out new water in to try to remove as much of the soap from the dishwasher as possible. After each of these three experiments, we filled drinking water into these bottles for 24 hours and just store them uh, without uh, sunlight. So just like you would maybe store your bottle um, with the drinking water in. And then we were analyzing the water of the sample with liquid chromatography coupled to high resolution mass spectrometry. I will not tell too much about the method, um, just in general what the overall method was behind we used. So that was the chemical fingerprinting where you get your chromatogram um, where different peaks and more or less each peak stays for one compound, one chemical. Then you have some compounds where you know the exact identity because you have your analytical standard. So you can even quantify these chemicals. Then you have some compounds where you have some hints in literature and this, you have also some fragmentation data from your high resolution mass spectrometer and com can compare with libraries. And with this comparison, you, um, you can identify more compounds, but then there are also some unknown compounds. So there you don't have library entries and that's more detective work where you really have to go um, into the fragments, into literature, and just figure out if you can find the identity of these compounds. And in this study, we uh, focus on the suspect screening and the non-target screening. Just a general overview, how the non-target screening was looking for the different samples. 
when we were looking what is leaching into the drinking water in the bottle from the reusable plastic bottle itself, we see a high amount of compounds already detected here. When we put the bubbles in the dishwasher, we see especially this nice um, homologous series of compounds eluting. And when we were flushing these bottles afterwards, then we see that we still have some of these compounds from the plastic left and some of these detergents. But I will talk now more in detail about all these compounds. So when we are looking now with this non-target approach, um, what is leaching out, then we see now each of these peaks is now transformed into a line in this heat map. So we see here now 2000 chemicals and when the line is red, that means it has a high intensity. When the line is blue, dark blue, then it means it was not detected in the sample. We have now here three samples, the new bottle, the bottle after the dishwasher, and the bottle after additional flushing. Now we see here some compounds which are only in the new bottles, but then they are gone. So they're not after the dishwasher and after additional flushing. So that seems that were production chemicals, which were also flushed away. Then we see also some production chemicals, which are persistent. So we have them in after the dishwasher. And when we look at the color of these lines, then some of them are even um, darker red. So that means it seems they are leaching more out of these bottles after the dishwasher process, and they are still in after the additional flushing. The highest amount of compounds which was in these bottles was the dishwasher soap chemicals itself, which were still all in after the dishwasher process, when you then immediately fill up your bottle with water. But if you do an additional flushing, then you see most of them are removed, but there are still some dishwasher soap chemicals which are sticked to the material and are not flushed away. Which are these compounds migrating from the dishwasher? So most of the identified compounds were detergents. What you have just seen this chromatogram is nice uh, homologous series. One example are polyoxyethylene lauryl ethers, which are non-ionic surfactants. They have an unpolar tail with methyl groups and a polar tail with different lengths of ethylene oxide groups. So the more of these ethylene oxide groups are here, the more polar is this compound. When we were looking what was leaching out of the bottles into the drinking water um, right after the dishwasher process, then we see here on the x-axis a uh, different length of this uh, ethylene oxy groups that they are all leaching out in similar high amounts. But then after we were carefully flushing this bottle and then filling it up with drinking water again, then we see that the more polar compounds are removed but the more less polar, polar compounds, so the shorter here the polar tail was, the more was still in the bottle. So the unpolar compounds are sticking more to the plastic and migrate into the drinking water even after additional flushing. Now to compounds we detected which are migrating from the plastic itself, we found polycarbolactone, which are biodegradable polyester, which makes sense that they are in this bottle. Um, but because they are biodegradable, uh, we found smaller molecules from them, um, which were migrating into the water. They are these oligomers with different uh, ring size from two to six. And yeah, we see that they are in the new bottles, but after the dishwasher process, there's even more of this biodegradable uh, plasticizers leaching out and also after additional flushing we have still quite some peak intensity left of these compounds. Another example what we detected is DEET. DEET is known um, as insect repellent in almost all insect repellents which are used. Um, and we saw it not in the new bottles, but in the used bottles, depending on how brittle the material was, we assume that was the main reason why th there were difference between the bottles. Um, yeah, there we saw high peak intensities of DEET. Now is the question, why is there an insect repellent in the plastic bottles? 
So DEET itself, when you read about the use, it's also saying don't use it when you wear a watch, for example, because it can uh, attack the material. And digging more into literature, there we found also a study which was uh, postulating that DEET can be used as plasticizer itself. Um, when we were looking at another compound, laurolactam, which is another plasticizer detected in the, in the bottles, which has only four hydrogens more than DEET. And we were looking at one, when is the peak intensity high from laurolactam, then mostly also DEET was increased in the peak intensity. So we still don't know for sure where DEET comes from, but it could be that it's used as a plasticizer itself, but it can also be that it's just a transformation product of, for example, laurolactam, and during the use, um, yeah, it's just transformed from laurolactam into DEET. Another compound group we detected were slip agents that are fatty amides, uh, which are migrating or blooming to the surface um, during the production. So they are in the material, and then during the production process, they bloom to the surface. And by that, the bottle is just easier to get out of the machine, like when you're baking and you want that your cake gets out of the form. Uh, then you use butter, and that's the same here for these slip agents. Uh, we detected them in the new bottles in high peak intensities. And the good thing here is that it seems that they are really um, a lot more removed after the washing process. And it's also what the producers recommend, of course, that you should use your uh, wash your bottle before use, and that helps for the slip agents. Then another compound group we detected were aromatic amines. Um, here first about the uh, peak intensity. So there you can see that they were not removed so nice after the dishwasher and after additional flushing. And these compounds were among the 10 highest compounds peaks, so peak intensity peaks, we um, detected in these new bottles. But we could also detect them still in this uh, one or two year old bottle. Um, and that's now also a little bit the limit of the non-target screening. So we couldn't find any literature which shows um, compounds with this chemical formula. Of course, with fragment data, we tried to suggest some um, chemical structures. And there we had three different possibilities. So the difference between the three uh, chemicals is a methyl group or two hydrogens um, added or subtracted. Um, yeah, and in general, the structures are fitting very well to also this slip agents. So it could be that it's formed as a transformation product of the slip agents, but it fits also that it's antioxidants with these groups here, which would be typical for antioxidants. So it could be they are formed during the use, but it could also be that these compounds are introduced um, during the production process. Um, we were also trying to estimate the toxicity for the 42 compounds we could finally identify. Um, yeah, many of these compounds are not well described, so we couldn't find much toxicity data about that. Um, so we used the Kramer rules that's just predicting based on the structure how toxic the compound could be. Um, but more interesting was the dark red one, that is the confirmed toxicity. So there we found really literature that these compounds are could be toxic depending on the concentration. Um, and here we see always dishwasher and after additional flushing for the different bottles. We see that all bottles had the highest toxicity after the dishwasher process and that the red bottle, bottle had the highest confirmed toxicity. Um, to this confirmed toxicity, mostly photo initiators were the dominant group, for example, ILGA Q369 and formethylbenzophenone, where uh, toxic effects are known. Yeah, but with this non-target screening without a standard, we cannot say something about the concentration. So we cannot say if it's a risk of this compound 
um, we can just say if the compound itself could be potential toxic. Yeah, so as a summary of the slide you have seen at the beginning already, we were talking about some of the compounds which were um, migrating from the plastic itself. Mainly plasticizers, slip agents, and photo initiators were there detected. Then the surfactants by the dishwasher and all the compounds which were still left after additional flushing of these bottles. So as a conclusion, we try to make a study under real consumer use um, and there we re revealed thousands of compounds which can migrate from plastic bottles. Um, so far, we were only identifying 42 contaminants and the risk of these bottles is unknown at the current stage, but we are also working on an approach uh, to quantify these non-target compounds and have hopefully soon uh, they are an approach, at least to estimate the concentration. Um, yeah, and I guess the main question is there are plastic bottles suitable for reuse in general, and especially when they are labeled as biodegradable plastic. And thank you for listening. And I think you have already the link to the paper in the chat. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Selina. Um, we are online, so you can't hear the applause, but I'm sure people are clapping. <laughs> it was a great talk. <laughs> um, I will quickly jump back to our agenda. Um, here we go. So with that, um, we come to our second speaker today. Um, it's my colleague, Dr. Birgit Goyke from Food Packaging Forum. Birgit, uh, we've almost, for 10 years now, work together. <laughs> um, Birgit is currently the senior scientific officer at FPF and her background is in environmental microbiology. And since she joined FPF in 2013, she's been relentlessly working on identifying hazardous chemicals and food contact materials and making this information available in a useful format to decision makers, researchers, and other stakeholders. And in May this year, um, we had FPF uh, published our brand new resource, the FCC MIGAX database. Um, and I really want to thank Birgit here again, because it's really thanks to her hard work that, that we could pull this off. It was a big team effort. So um, many thanks, uh, Birgit, and over to you. You are still muted, Birgit. <laughs> okay, thank you, Jane. Uh, but you can see my screen. Good. Um, yeah, and thank you, Selina, for the great presentation um, about the plastic sports bottles. I found that really interesting. I'm going to talk a little bit more about all reusable food packaging or and food contact articles. Um, because um, as Jane said, we have just published this systematic evidence map, how we sometimes call it, or just the database, FCC MIGEX database, where we addressed one main question, um, what kind of chemicals have ever been measured in migrates and extracts of food contact materials and articles? And today I will, since the topic of the, uh, the webinar today is reusable plastics, so I will just focus on the information we have about re reusable plastic food contact materials and what we can find in the FCC MIGEX database. So as you probably all know, a key issue with these um, so-called food contact chemicals or FCCs, as we name them, um, is that they can move or migrate from the packaging and other food contact articles into the food we eat. And this process of chemical migration um, is relevant because then we consume these chemicals on a regular basis at usually small concentrations, but like every day. And um, in this picture, you see some of the well-known examples. And, and if you can read the chemical names, I hope so, you, you probably recognize quite some of them. 
But if you go to the scientific literature, you see that there are many, many, many more chemicals. And some of them are only mentioned in one or two or three papers. And so they don't get the attention they may need to deserve. Um, so that was the start of our study where we said, OK, we want to get this overview. We want to answer this question, which food contact chemicals have ever been measured in the migrates and extracts of food contact materials? So the results of this project, which took us over three years, have been recently published um, in the critical reviews in food science and nutrition. And this paper is freely available. You may have seen it already. We hope so. And it explains how we generated all the data. So we have more than 22,000 database entries, which form this systematic evidence map. And um, this paper also explains what it really, what these data mean. And um, you will hear me using the term database entry quite frequently. So in short, it means that we have a, a huge spreadsheet and with more than 2, uh, 22,000 um, lines and each line is a database entry and it contains information about the chemical from which type of food contact material and article it, it came from, how the experiment was designed. Um, and importantly, it also links to the to the reference where we got this information from. So it can happen that one reference, one scientific study just gave one database entry and others gave several hundreds. And maybe even more important for you, we also published a free and interactive tool, the FCC MIGEX database or database on migrating and extractable food contact chemicals. And if you want to use this tool, you can, you can search for chemicals, you can filter the information, you have different um, visual interfaces which you can use. So on the left side, you see our data view, as we call it, where you can, yeah, as I said, search for chemicals or select a certain food contact material, select a certain um, type of experiment that has been performed. And if you, and then you get mainly numbers and the chemical names. If you're more interested in the underlying information, you can go to the reference view, you see a, a screenshot on the right here. And um, this shows all the references for your filtered and selected criteria. So today I'm, I'm going to focus on the data we have on reusable, or we call it, call it in the database repeat use, FCMs. And you see here how these data distribute um, or are distributed over the different categories. So most of our data are on single use food contact materials, so typically food packaging, and only 14% of the data are could be assigned to repeat use. So these were experiments where the where it was clearly stated in the paper that a repeat use food contact article was tested. And then we got got all our database entries and you see 14% are only on repeat use. Um, another way to show the same data is to split them across the different food contact materials. So we, we have this information also in the database. And there you see again that plastic, or for plastic we generated most database entries, followed by paper and board, and then the other FCMs. And um, multi-materials have many database entries, metals and glass, uh, glass and ceramics. And if you look at the colored bars in this figure, you see that the reuse proportion of of our database entries is very different for the different FCMs. So for plastics, it's just the average of 14% 14, 14 as you've seen on the, on the slide before. And paper and board and multi-materials, everybody can imagine that these food contact articles are typically, typically not reused um, in contrast to glass and ceramics where the reuse rate is obviously very high because we also have many data on reusable glass and ceramics. So now I've just taken the data which we have for plastic and we have um, split the data into 12 different categories for plastics. You see it here, so mainly different polymers, but then we have also some groups where we had to, yeah, to collect all the data which where we didn't have information on the polymer 
And again, you see very different reuse rates, I call it. Of course, it's not representing what is on the market, but only the experiments which have been performed in all the studies which we, which we have evaluated during our systematic evidence map. So again, for multi-layer plastics, for example, there's simply no reuse. And for others, like for um, polyamide or nylon, polycarbonate or melamine resin, we have really high reuse rates. So these are obviously the, the polymers that are typically used in food contact articles, which are not, not single use. And today I'm, I'm just showing you some examples of chemicals of these three groups of polymers to give you an idea what kind of information we have in our database. Of course, we have much more, but I just had, had to make a selection. So let's start with melamine. There is a little bit confusion maybe about the name. So if we talk about melamine, usually we mean the polymer or the melamine resin, but um, it would be more correct to always say melamine resin or melamine formaldehyde resin, because um, if you say melamine, you, you use the name of the monomer, which is used to produce the polymer. So um, just to, to explain that, so if we have a, for example, a plate or, or a cup made, of mel made out of melamine resin, um, there were quite some studies on these type of, of food contact articles and the, chemicals which, which have been measured most frequently were the monomers, melamine, and um, concerningly also formaldehyde. So um, they are released very frequently. And usually, if you go into the details of the studies, you see that the, um, the ratios of migration increase over time. So obviously, melamine is not stable enough to be repeatedly used without guaranteeing a safe level of, of migration. Another um, material is polyamide. That's for example, a black kitchen utensil you, you may have in your, in your kitchen to store in your, in your pan or in your, in your pot. And um, there we have seen many more different chemicals at high frequencies. So we have da many database entries for um, oligomers in green, all different oligomers. So I didn't include the full names, but um, of course we have this information. Um, we also found a typical monomer, caprolactam, and we found primary aromatic amines, which are known carcinogens and um, which of course shouldn't be there, which are addressed frequently, but obviously it's not not that easy to get rid of them in, in polyamide. So um, yeah, that's maybe the concerning news about polyamide kitchen utensils and other, other materials made for reuse. And the third example, last but not least about polycarbonate. That's maybe the least surprising. Polycarbonate is mainly used in, yeah, or has been used. It's being replaced by other materials, but still, Still, you can find it. It's um, mainly used also in reusable plastic bottles. And there we find a lot of bisphenol A in the migrates and extracts. And then much less frequently certain plastic additives such as phthalates, tinovin, and also pigments were found in the migrates. And as I said in the beginning, we have so many more data in our database. So here you see how the, the dashboard looks like if we apply the filters I've used for this for the last slides. So we have um, 1,083 database entries for plastics, for, for reusable plastics. And um, in total, we have 454 chemicals that have been detected in the migrates and extracts of reusable plastics. So there are many more. And um, if you want to know the details, you can, by just clicking a few times, you can get all the references which were used for all these experiments. So I really warmly invite you, if you're interested in, in this topic, to go there and, and just play around to search for specific chemicals you have. And with that, 
I'm done and I hope that we have enough time for discussions and questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Thank you so much, Birgit. Yes, we do have time for discussion and questions. So now I would like you to um, ask questions if you have any. Uh, you can raise your hand uh, in Zoom um, if you want to speak or you can also make use of the chat. Um, and as we're waiting for questions, oh, Kevin Bridgeton has a question. Kevin, would you like to unmute yourself, ask your question? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, given the, the information in the database, which is fantastic, by the way, I absolutely love it. Um, I just wondered um, if there's any plans to do any other sort of investigations, non-targeted screening type work, looking at other types of uh, plastic water bottles, polypropylene, poly, you know, uh, polycarbonate and the like. Great, thanks. That's a question for Selina, I think. Yes, so we would like to investigate more, but that was really a study out of curiosity. And <laughs> for more studies, we need a little bit of funding. So <laughs> we first need to write some application to get the funding to do more mm -hmm. in this topic. Maybe just to follow up Kevin's question, I mean, Selina, um, here in Switzerland, where, where we are based, we see more and more reusable um, takeout containers and oftentimes made of plastic. So I don't know if that's something you would even dare to study. You're a water, uh, water person. <laughs> would you also look at migration into oil or fatty food similants, ethanol? Um, yeah, so we, when it's, when it's used for that, yes. So in this study, we were really, I'm trying, there are often studies which use methanol, for example, um, or some other stuff where it's um, nicer migrating, but because we were at the beginning still more into the water sector, we really want to know when you just use water, where you think the less should happen, what happens, and we saw that a lot is still already happening. Um, yeah, that's why we started with this one. We were, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, we were also looking at, for example, the one-time bottle, what you just buy in the grocery and we're just analyzing the water in there and there we were finding a way with fewer compounds so there we were not investigating more because the other one was so interesting because there were so many compounds in and the other one the time limitation that we thought oh that's really not a lot what you see in these bottles yeah i, I mean what i think is interesting is that we often think okay water is a boring <laughs> medium in a way, and plastic um, contains a lot of lipophilic compounds, so you wouldn't expect a lot of action in, you know, polar solvent, but you, you, yes, said, exactly. you said you saw thousands of chemicals, right? Yeah. Yeah, so maybe what I also didn't say was with these glass bottles, the comparison, so after the dishwasher process, we had the same amount of chemicals in both in, but after additional flushing, the glass bottles were completely clean. There was no compound left. And in these plastic bottles, they were still leaching out. Mm. Great. Um, any other questions? You can raise hands, otherwise I've got a few. So um, let's talk about surprises in your study, Selina. Um, and maybe Birgit, you can also think about whether there were any surprises in, in your analysis. Um, I was surprised by, by DEET and I kind of first thought, well, maybe they use it on the lawn, you know, and the bottles get thrown onto the lawn and then somehow from the lawn, it gets taken up. But, but you offered an alternative explanation with the uh, lauro lactam. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned lauro lactam is a, a plasticizer, but how come polyethylene needs plasticizers? Can you explain a little bit more why it's used? Do you know? Yes, no, we, we don't know. That was also the question from Adam. Why are then plasticizers in? Um, for that compound, we also had an analytical standard, so we could pretty clearly identify this compound. Um, but I don't know why it's, why it's in. Mm -hmm. And were there any other surprises that you didn't have time to get into? Um, uh, yeah, I think this this deed was the main surprise. So first, I also realized when this was getting into the media and people were thinking, oh, the insect repellent is in our water. Then 
first then I realized, okay, of course, for people who know this chemical, it's then even more surprising when you know it from another use, which yeah. doesn't mean it's from the same use coming in, but it just means what transformation can do with compounds. Yeah, and I just, had, while you gave your presentation, I just checked uh, whether we have deed in the FCC MIGEX database and we do have it there. So it has been okay. three times detected in different plastics. I don't know which ones, I didn't find the mm -hmm. time for that. But the studies are already from 2007, 2014 and 2021. So um, it's all, maybe it's, worth following up. Yes, mm -hmm. it's also um, a difficult compound because it's often in blind peaks. So it's just everywhere. And when you analyze water, it can always happen that you find these and there's also a little bit of mystery where it always comes from. Um, so it seems there's also other use in insect repellent. Um, but here we could be really sure it is in the bottles because it was quite a big uh, difference from the peak response in our reference and in the plastic bottles. Okay, so that's something that we need to um, follow up on, I guess. What's the origin? Birgit, any surprises in FCC MIGAX apart from the DEET? <laughs> I'm sure there are many more surprises. Um, if, we, if we start looking at the data. So what about the primary aromatic amines? That was not a surprise. So we, have, we were aware of them that they are around and um, that's not nice to see them, but we, we really expected them and i think since they're even addressed in annex two of the plastics regulation um yeah that's widely known that that we have to take care of these compounds and that we really should try to get get rid of them and and measure them routinely so I, of course that also shows they are addressed and people do measure them, so that's good on the one hand, and then if they are still detected, that's not good. So that has to be solved. We we could do a time trend there and see if if the detection rates go down. So if if mm -hmm. maybe ten years ago they have been detected more frequently and yeah. and now they are kind of gone, that would be nice to see. Yeah. Same maybe also for BPA. Huh? That could be interesting. yeah yeah. This information is is still sitting in the yeah. in the data, but we haven't analyzed them. Good. So, Susanna Fonseca, you have um, you have a comment. Do you want to unmute yourself? Turn on your video. Uh, yeah, sure. Hello, everyone. Thank you for sharing all this information. Uh, yeah, I, I I'm I work for an NGO, and we've been promoting reusable solutions a lot. Um, yeah, and this is my has been my concern. I, I already I've been in other events that you organized, and uh, so I know about the issue. It's it's kind of the elephant in the room, because for certain areas like uh, takeaway um, plastic is really I mean reusable plastic solutions are really like the lead solutions that are being used not right now. So not so much uh, you know like uh, metal or or glass, which. Yeah, most most even business uh, considers uh, you know, restaurants etc. They consider it very very complicated to deal with glass uh, in these circumstances. I mean, I'm not so concerned about beverages because there's a solution. Glass is clearly a good solution, but I don't know any kind of advice. I mean, from the experience on the data you have, um, because the the last thing we would like to do as a movement is to be advocating for solutions that you know like. Uh, Two years, five years from now, we will have to say that uh, they are not really the best um, option. I don't know. Any okay, help. thank you, Susanna. Who wants to take this? Birgit? Selina? I have maybe just one comment. So in our study, I think the problem was that it was advertised as biodegradable plastic. So I don't know if it makes sense to have something reusable when it should be um, biodegradable so that was here a little bit the thing about it I don't know if it would have been with a bottle which is not biodegradable mm -hmm. so that still would need to be investigated mm -hmm. so we we have these plastics or maybe we don't have them anymore but um, my kids complained about the sports bottles which are not labeled biodegradable these probably also not too expensive bottles of of whatever plastic you don't know it 
which really don't smell nicely. And if, you, if they lie in the sun, I think there is a lot of migration in any case, whether it's biodegradable or not, I think that's not, not an ideal option. And to address this from a scientific perspective, I think it would, would at least make sense to, to check the stability of polymers over time. So I think, for example, melamine is a really bad example because it really, you, you have studies where you see it degrades after each use cycle a little bit more and it releases more chemicals after each use cycle. And I don't have this figures in front of my eye for other polymers. So maybe some are more stable than, than melamine, probably. But I think it, it, this would be the minimum requirement. And maybe we can just say, okay, we, we have this concern. Maybe we go to something which is which is really like stable and doesn't release, release many chemicals and you can use it not only 20 times, but maybe a hundred times. Yeah, I mean, I think or another point to make- Several hundred times, yeah. Yeah, migration is not a one-way street. And, you know, materials that um, have high levels of migration, they will also absorb chemicals. And then of course, the question is, uh, well, Selena looked at that quite nicely, the detergents, some of the chemicals in the detergents get absorbed into the plastic. But then, of course, if you're storing other things than water in there, um, like you have for restaurant uh, takeaway packaging, you'll have curries or tomato sauce or, you know, whatever. And that then also will be absorbed by uh, non-inert materials. And I think the discoloring, but also the the... the the taste, the flavor that gets absorbed could mean that, you know, maybe you have to change those containers more frequently than you would have to change inert containers. So that's also another thought, the consumer acceptance. But yeah, it's obviously not, there are no easy answers. So Ernst Simon has a question or a comment and he cannot um, uh, share his video and unmute himself. So I'll read it out for you, Ernst. Um, the number of entries in the database only corresponds to a frequency, but this does not necessarily correlate with a hazard. Are 10 microgram level findings more threatening than one milligram level findings? And even the frequency only says something about the preference of the scientists for a certain area. The frequency of the findings should better be related to the number of publications in which the specific chemical was searched for. So Birgit, that's, that's for you. Yes, um, I agree. So we we don't have the concentration. So we we discussed it a lot in the beginning. It would have been really nice, but we we couldn't do it. That would have been too much work for our small team. So we said, okay, people can always go and get the references and 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 look at the concentration. So that's a job you have to do. I'm sorry that we don't provide this data, and um, of course high concentrations seem to be more concerning, but for certain kinds, kinds of chemicals, uh, if we apply the hazard-based approach, we, we shouldn't have these chemicals. We shouldn't have carcinogens. We shouldn't have certain EDCs in, in our migrates and extracts. So I think it, it makes sense to monitor all these chemicals. And um, then we, we need to have a closer look at the data. And the second question, I completely agree. We we couldn't solve it. So the frequency says something about the preference that certain chemicals are studied again and again because maybe you know that you find them and then it's it's easier to study them. And it's yeah, I think Selena knows this. It's much more difficult to identify unknown chemicals. So um, and we did also this relation that we related the frequency to the number of publications, but that didn't change the picture so much. And you could even still do that with the data we have in the dashboard. So we decided to just keep the absolute numbers. And um, with each view in the dashboard, you see the number of references, the number of chemicals and the number of database entries. So you have this information, but we, we didn't calculate the quotient for, yeah, to, to keep it, to keep the, like the, the basic data visible. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Birgit. And thank you, Ernst. Um, 
In addition, I put a link in the chat of a paper that our colleague Lisa Zimmermann uh, was lead author on that was recently published where we analyzed the, the chemicals of most concern um, that are used in food contact materials um, where you can actually drill into, you know, what are the, the highest concerns, carcinogens, EDCs, also persistence uh, issues, which is then, of course, important when it comes to biodegradable uh, food contact materials. So I invite you to have a look at that. And maybe just to follow up, uh, of course, you know, we look at individual chemicals, but as Selena showed nicely, there are thousands of chemicals that migrate at the same time. And what no one is looking at right now, at least not systematically, is what is the effect of that mixture. And so that also, uh, and I think that's also important to keep that in mind when we're talking about concentrations of individual chemicals. At the end of the day, what matters is what people ingest. And individual levels may be low, but the mixtures may be biologically active. OK, is there anything else to add? Any final words from our speakers? <laughs> no? Any other questions? Then I suggest that we call it a day. Um, so I want to thank uh, Birgit and Selina and also uh, all of you um, who joined and listened and actively um, participated to the webinar. Um, we'll make this recording available on our website so shortly, as I said, and I also want to plug our annual workshop, which is coming up on the 6th of October, where um, we've already published some of the names of the speakers and we'll, we'll publish a full program shortly. Um, but in any case, it's going to be a very special workshop because it's our 10th anniversary workshop, so there will even be a banquet dinner after the workshop. Um, and so you can, of course, also join online, but then the banquet dinner is going to be a bit boring. <laughs> so I invite you to come to Zurich. Uh, we will uh, take stock of the past decade in food contact materials and chemicals and speak about what's changed and what's to come. Um, and I can ensure you that there are many high profile, smart and interesting speakers, panelists and participants that will be there. And so, yeah please uh, check out our website to see more details. And with that, I would like to thank all of you for being part of this webinar today and wish you a great continuation of your day. Take care. Talk to you soon. Bye.